turn with me in John chapter 14. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Come on, y'all celebrate the worship of the King this morning. Amen. God will do whatever he want to do because I, I sat there and wrestled with God this morning. I said, I don't know. We ain't going to get out of no kind of altar service. Enough. We just going to get in and get out and go. No, nah, that wasn't. He said, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. <laughs> he said, forget you. <laughs> it's all right. God's got permission to do whatever he wants to do in his church. Amen. That being said, I done cut the worship team half off. I had to find a way to cut myself half off. So. This is what we're going to do. Let's read out of John 14, and let me see if I can get a piece of this out to you for just a few minutes. It says, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Father, thank you for it's an amazing day in your kingdom. God, I thank you for every body that was healed, every mind that was delivered, God. Father, I thank you for those that accepted Christ today. God, I give you honor for that, God. Lord, we thank you that the kingdom, God, is growing, Father, and that cities are being shifted. Lord, Spirit, God, your spirit, God, is waging war against the spirit of this culture, and we are winning. Hallelujah. Father, thank you, Lord, for this moment. I pray your anointing, God, give us grace, God, to receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, won't you love somebody real quick? Turn, shake hands, love somebody. Do something. Share, uh, share this live stream for just a minute. Everybody good? Come on now. Everybody good? How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm glad to see you. Y'all, this is awesome. Well, I'm going to take a picture real quick. You know, just, just let me take a picture. Mm. Say cheese or do something. Mm. Amen. Well, thank you. I love you too. Listen, he he's going to hate me for this and he might not come back to church, but I really don't care. I got to celebrate Stephen Wesley because this man fabricated this thing this week. This is phenomenal, y'all. This thing here is, this has blown my mind. It's beautiful. I'm amazed at the gifts that God has given men and women. Because I couldn't, I couldn't start anywhere on this. I, w I mean, this is crazy. And what y'all don't see is what is carved into the top of this thing. But this ministry was founded on the verse Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And it's engraved in the top of this. In Hebrew, in Greek, and in English. It's bad to the bone, man. You're awesome, dude. He's going to try to hide from me, but y'all need to tell him he's awesome too when you see him. He's bald-headed. He's got a goatee. He's sitting right here in this section, okay? <clears throat> Listen, man, I honor. I got to show honor. If I don't show honor, God's going to do something to me. So This is awesome. Let me try to share this with you for just a second. We are going to have a, uh, our family fun day. We're going to have a baptism today, and so... Uh, instructions for that as soon as we close up if you're getting baptized uh, all you ch uh, parents of children make sure you go check your kids out and get them down to our family fun day uh, but if you uh, if you are getting baptized we have some changing stations out at the bab uh, at the baptistry area you can also use our bathrooms here um, and uh, and just make sure to get outside and get set up and let's let's roll and then we're gonna have some fun um, God's blessed us with an awesome day and uh, I'm so thankful for that so let me share really quickly uh, this with you, and I'm probably only gonna, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to have to get just some of it out so we can get out of here. Certainly can't hand it all to you, but um, God has you know, really been speaking to us about represent this this um, this series represent that we we are growing in in righteousness. Y'all may have to give me uh, a handheld. It's going in and out a little bit. Um, let me let me just hold it, keep it held for me. Uh, that God has been really stretching us and really challenging our spirit to grow in holiness and sometimes i get criticized and ridiculed for preaching so heavy and so hard on holiness but i really don't care because the bible says be holy as, we, as he is holy and i'm not interested here's the thing is i'm not interested our the the, cult, the spirit of our culture has ruled too long and if we're going to change anything for the kingdom of god it's going to require a different spirit 
And the problem with the church for the most part is, is that we've professed a different language, but we've maintained the same spirit. I ain't, I ain't going to get no help already. We got a lot of non-rejuvenate people in here. Y'all going to have to get with me, okay? And so uh, we have even, that has caused us to even change the way that we, uh, uh, kind of the way that we operate. We have put it upon the church. And when I, when I say the church, I'm talking about the building itself, the organization. We have put it upon the church to, uh, he's got one right here. Uh, we have put it upon the church to be uh, kind of the revelation mechanism to our culture of who the king is. We have put it upon our church. Yeah, let me have it. We've put it upon our church to be um, the thing that, that exposes who God is and attracts people. And we have this huge uh, caveat in trying to draw people into the kingdom of God because we have put the responsibility of attraction on the church. And because of that, is it has rendered us largely, across, really across especially our nation, it has rendered us largely uh, ineffective when it comes to transformation. Because we put it on the church to be a marketing tool. And so now our focus has, got to, has become on, uh, on, on how well we market, on how well we have lights and we have music and we have sound and we have all of these things that are really great, but they're ineffective in transforming lives. And so now we've put the pressure and the strain upon the church to try to find a way to market itself because uh, we want to grow the church, obviously, but we've, we've got to find some way to invade ourselves into culture and do it the same way that Toyota and Coca-Cola and Budweiser does it and expect them to be drawn into the church. And it's, it's after a while, we've, okay, we found a way to awaken and bring people in, but now because we're out of order in our mode of operation, it leaves people without transformation. The church's responsibility was to disciple maturity and purpose. The church's responsibility was to equip and train for the work of the ministry. Ephesians 4 lists out the five offices. Uh, the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist it lists out the five offices of the ministry of the church. And then it says that those are called in order to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so it's left us in a big, huge gap where we're not transformational because in an effort to try to attract, we have lost discipleship. And when we lost discipleship, we lost transformation. Can I just jump in? Because I ain't got a whole lot of time. I have to cut it in half. So I'm just going to get with you real quick. And so we have, we have lost, we have, because we're so focused on, let me try to be attractional and not transformational. And what it has done it is, 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 is taken the responsibility off the individual to be attractional. And put it on the church. When the church was supposed to be the place that received the attraction from the individual and then taught them and trained them and then recycled them out the door in order that we could create this flow that we bring them in by attraction through people, we train them up by the education of the church and we send them out to be transformational in our culture. But instead of being a living, a flowing living water river of life, we have become a cesspool. And so I find this interesting because Jesus was called the Word. We talked about that last week. Last week we talked about determining what you base uh, and determine your truths to be will determine what spirit you attract. Jesus was the Word. He was the perfect image of God. But He was also the perfect image of who we were to be. And so as He was the Word, we're to be the Word. As He's the living Word, we're to be the living Word. You ever heard the phrase, I can read you like a book? You know, we find that offensive. We almost get scared of that because we don't want people to see inside of us. You know why? Because we're putting too many things in the closet. I'm just going to jump right in there. If you get, we ain't waiting. We're swimming today, okay? We're afraid for people to read us like a book because we're afraid for them to look beyond our eyes and into our soul at what we might be hiding and what we might be pushing back because we know what we have confessed and professed before them, but we don't want to show them the back door. You understand why? Because our spirit and our language don't match. 
But the truth of the matter is, it's quite interesting to me that he's called the living word. He's the living word. Isn't this a book? And if he's the perfect representation of what I was supposed to be, then the idea of my life is that I'm to be read like a book. That you should be able to read me like a book. And I should not be afraid. That I should present myself as an open book and not be offended when you look deeper. Because although I may have some pains and some mistakes, at the, here's the way it's supposed to work in the kingdom. At the moment that I have received his blood payment, it does something to me that yesterday becomes the old news and today becomes the new thing that he's doing in me. And so I don't care if you peek deep inside of who I am and see what happened yesterday because it ain't who I am no more. I have turned my lifestyle around and I'm walking in the truth of the king. So look as deep as you want to look because it's the only thing that will change your life. Jesus, I, I can't even remember, some of you great theologians might can tell me this, but somebody preached a message or made a comment one time that said something about uh, preach at all times and when necessary, use words. I don't know who that was, some of y'all might, but, but that's what they said. And that's exactly Jesus' life. For he preached at all times. And then when it was necessary, to he that had ears, he taught them with words. But his life reflected the book of the kingdom. His life reflected the constitution of the kingdom. At every step that he took, at every moment that he took, at every person he encountered, they were transformed by the book of his life. And so we, we have this responsibility to be, to be a living word. God is still, get this, if you don't get nothing else today, this is where I can shut it down. God is still speaking, but we are limiting his voice. When we are not spirit led in both our language and our expression. We are limiting the voice of God. Listen. You can't tell me that a limitless God can be contained in 66 books. Yet here's the problem is that we don't even find ourselves reaching for this much. And we have even made it a novelty in church that if we can read this through, we've done something. We'll celebrate just reading it through. And God's just begging for somebody, let me talk to you every day. Let me talk to you at every moment. I'm not finished speaking. I've got much more I want. Y'all, we praying for new things to happen, yet we won't let a new spirit release. We won't let a new anointing release. We won't let a new voice, a new word, a fresh word. We pray for a rhema word, but we don't want to release a rhema word. And in order for a rhema word to be released for our generation, we must allow ourselves to be transformed by his spirit because the Bible says, what's what happens when the spirit gets a hold of you? It does two things. I'm going to jump to the end first. And it says, it will bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. So it says, the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to bring to remembrance all the writings of the old prophets. And I'm going to bring to remembrance all the writings of the apostles. And I'm going to bring to remembrance everything that Jesus taught as he walked. But I'm not done. For he will teach you all things. For he will teach you all. He will bring to him, but he will teach you all things. What I get uh, love about this is it lets me know that we have this capacity to reach towards an endless God. And God does not want to withhold himself from us. He says, I'll give you all things if you want all things. If you'll seek me deeper, I'll show myself to you greater. If you'll pursue me more, man, I'll give you revelation upon revelation upon revelation. And it will begin to flow in your life and out of your life. And you shall not be able to contain who I am. I am. But you got to be willing to let people read your book.
you got to be willing to be not just spirit empowered. You know, this is interesting. We we want to heal. We just had a, a moment where we prayed for people to be healed. And that seems to what gets us excited. You know what gets him excited? Not, not, not the healing. See, that's normal to him. What gets him excited is when somebody says, you know what, I'm, I'm done with that, 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 that yesterday guy. I'm done with that spirit from yesterday. I need him. I need d- more of him. I need deeper of him. I need a new spirit inside. I want more of God than I have ever wanted in my entire life. I want to experience his glory. That's something that will cause him to get up off his throne. Because the truth is, is that healing and deliverance are normal in the kingdom for people that pursue his spirit. So God, reveal to me more of who you are so that I can begin to walk this thing out according to what you desire. The thing, the thing is, is that we have, you know, I don't want to take any weight off, off the Bible. This is, this is our constitution for our kingdom. The truth of the matter is, is that, is that this thing here was actually built for church folk. You were built for the world. This was built for church folk. It's why we we break down in relationship and trying to reach people when we go out trying to preach them the word and they don't want the word, they want relationship with you. And through the relationship with you, it opens them up to a spirit that will teach them and train them in the word. But we keep trying to throw this at them and you need to do this and you need to read this and this is how I'm going to be evangelistic and this is how I'm going to transform the world. You will transform the world by opening up your book and allowing people to see the inside of what God has done in your life. Because this is for church folk. This is to educate you and I on the constitutional foundation of our kingdom. That's what this is about. It's interesting to me that that we want the life of Jesus, but Jesus never preached from a book. He had the word hidden in him, and the spirit revealed all things the father said. And so he didn't, wait a minute, let me try to find it in this passage here. No, he just walked it, and he allowed the Holy Spirit to reveal, and the Holy Spirit to lead. And the same pattern of life that Jesus walked is how you and I should move. It's how you and I should expect. Sometimes we fumble and worry about our own inadequacies that say, well, I don't know what to say, and I don't know what to do, and I don't know how to pray. And he says, just stop, because I'll come. I'll become strong in your weaknesses. If you'll just give room for my spirit to work, it will work. But you've got to be willing to open your book. Open your book. For I will teach you all things. That somewhere Paul said in there that I may become all things to all men in order that I might reach some. He will teach me all things because he knows where he's sending me. And there are some places in my life that this won't gain entrance, but this will. There are some places in my life that this won't allow me in the door, but the fact that I was a delivered drug abuser will open the door for me, and they can look on the inside of my... There are some places in my life that I can't carry that book. It will become offensive, and people will retract. But I can walk in with the Word hidden inside of me, and my book open, and the Spirit of God flowing through me, and it will change lives. It amazes me that that the New Testament people that uh, never had a book to read from. They wrote it with their life. And then we believe that God's word is finished. We're still living in this thing called revelation. Isn't that interesting? Revelation. And we have put this stigma on revelation that it means end times. No, revelation means the openness to understanding God's mind. It's what reve- It means revealed. It means show us more of who you are. Let me walk in the hour where there's greater revelation. Am I doing all right for y'all? Some of y'all people that ain't normal to rejuvenate y'all all right with this. So let me show you this real quick. If we go back, go to uh, go to chapter. I mean, uh, verse verse eight and nine. 
Philip, <laughs> Philip and Jesus are having a conversation, and it's so funny because it reflects so much on the church. Jesus is wanting them to go deeper. And Philip says, show us the Father. Basically what he's saying is, give me visible awareness of who he is. He says, show me something that my eyes can see. That's what it translates. Show me something that, that, that my eyes can see. And what it says, and, and that it is sufficient for us. He says that it's, that it's really satisfying enough that I want it. Show me something with my eyes, okay? I just, wanna, I just want something superficial. And when I see it, I'll determine whether it's good enough for me or not to go deeper. And Jesus says, no, 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 you don't understand. He says, have I been with you so long that yet you have not known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Why? Because I've opened my book. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Now watch. This is important. He creates a relationship right here that we have to understand. For the words that I speak, the words that I speak, I do not speak on my own authority. But he transitions without and just kind of hides it. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. The words that I speak, we like to be wordy in the church. Somebody need a word, we'll give them a word. They ain't going to get no help in this side. We, 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 we like to be wordy in the church. You know why? Because words oftentimes bring gratification and glorification to us. But works. Now, can I, can I, can I redefine this for you for a minute? Because we have even redefined this word. We have made works in the church a service project. So here's what we do. So as long as my words are right and I serve every now and then, as long as my words sound good and I just serve in the community and I do a good thing every now and then, then apparently things are okay. They say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Works. Works weren't about your service. It was about your lifestyle. See, because works don't just speak to an act. It speaks to a revelatory operation of who you are day in and day out. It speaks to your being. Works don't just give definition to your hands. It gives definition to your character. It gives definition to your attitude. It gives definition to your language. It gives definition to everything that comes out of your life, man. And he said, so it's not, it's not just enough that you have words and that you serve. It's enough that you have words that are paired with the Spirit of God. We have to become people that understand there is a great relationship between the words of God and the lifestyle of God. That lifestyle becomes necessary because the thing that was to attract people that don't know his mind was your life. We keep believing that the responsibility of the church is to get people saved. No, that's your responsibility. It's my responsibility to train them up and who God built them to be to send them back out that we create multiplication. It's your responsibility to be the attraction to the kingdom. People are supposed to be able to look upon you and say, man, I don't know what it is about them. And I've never even heard them speak, but the spirit of God is upon her life. I don't, it shifted the room when she walked in. The room just lit up. There was a smile on her face and there was joy in her heart. And something happened when she came in the room. I can't explain it. I don't even know her name, but it changed everything when she got here. For we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the power of my work. The power of my lifestyle and the transformation of the Spirit of God in me. So he says, most surely I say to you that he who believes in me, and we covered this last week, right? This belief ain't just some kind of, you just had an idea that Jesus was good. This was a revelatory understanding of experiential knowledge that I've been close enough to touch him. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. 
That has been perplexing to the church for years. How in the world can we do more than Jesus did? How can we do more than what Jesus did? It's not that we have a greater power than what Jesus had. It's that we have an opportunity for endless revelation. It's the fact that we have the ability to hear from God at every moment at every day. Jesus was given 33 and a half years on this earth. He walked in his ministry for three years. And you and I have been given the promise of 70 years and beyond if it's according to, to the word of the Lord. But you and I have the opportunity to go farther, to go wider. Jesus was confined to a small property in a small space and a landmass within Jerusalem and around. But you and I go across the world. We can pick up our phones and we can talk to people thousands of miles away instantaneously. You and I have a greater opportunity to do greater works than if ever been done in the history of our world and we're blown away that Billy Graham saved so many the world's just waiting on the next man up but we don't know the possibility that's in us because I won't get close enough to the spirit to touch him and I won't open up my book to let him be revealed Whatever you ask in my name that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask in my name anything in my name, I will do it. Oh, I got so much more. Yeah, let me show him this real quick. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is the how. If you love me, Keep my commandments. This is how it translates. The word translate or key, uh, keep translates to both observe, which means to fulfill and comply, but this is important. It also means to guard and to keep intact. If you love me, keep my word intact. If you love me, it's your life that shall guard my word. If you love me, you have a responsibility that my truth does not become fragmented. If you love me, it means that you don't have the ability to create a division in the minds of people based on what they hear you say and what, what they watch you do. For if you love me, you keep my commandments. It's he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and I will manifest myself to I will show myself to him. I will show myself to his environment. Go keep going further. Is it in there? One more. Do we go to 20? If he says, I will show myself to him. If you love me, I will show I, I will show myself to him. If you love me, keep my commandments. And it says in verse in verse 20, uh, going back to 19, it says, because I live, you will live also. Because I live, because I have displayed my life, I have opened my book, you will live also. The word live right there means to live in a messianic sense. Because I have displayed the book, you can display the book. Because I have paved the way, you can pave the way. So that where I am, there you shall be. So that what I do, you shall do. So that greater than what I did, you shall do. Because I live, you know the way. And he who has my commandments... And he who keeps them, it is he who loves me. It is him that not only hears my commandments, but it's him that lives my commandments. It is he who loves me. This word love is, is important in this passage because it actually means a discriminatory love by choice. It means that him that loves me will discriminate against all else that he's attracted to. For my sake. It means him that loves me, him that desires me, him that desires my life and, and my words and my spirit. It's him that will divide himself from anything, anything that will corrupt his attention from me. It's not that I will remove it, it's that he will make a decision to leave it. And it's him who will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Let me let me shut it down with this. Go back to 
John 14 and uh, 12 through 14, I believe it is. So most assuredly, I say to you that he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do. And greater works than these will he do because I go to my father. In 13, it says, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the father may be glorified in the son. Whatever you ask in my name. Somebody say whatever. What does that mean to you? Anything. Anything. We pray to a God with limitless possibilities. With very limited prayer. With very limited access to Him manifesting Himself out of our life. But He says, whatever you ask in my name, whatever you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I'm going to read something to you. I don't worry about the ladies back there going back to it. But in verse, in verse 20, it says, At that day you will know that I am in my Father and that you are in me. And then we come back to the verse in verse 13. It says, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified through the Son. Who's the Son? If you desire my spirit, if you make discriminatory choices towards pushing things aside and desiring me to go deeper and deeper to where my words and my spirit shall begin to work in a flow in your life, he says, you become the image of my son. And the more and more as you become the image of my son, the more you ask. Test. The enemy don't want all this. Whatever you ask, whatever you ask, I'll do that I may be glorified through the image of my son. Whatever you ask, as long as your life isn't fragmented, as long as, as, as you protect and guard my word, whatever you ask, I'll do. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. The translation of asking anything in my name. Can I give you some revelation as we close up? We have this thought process that let me just pray these cute prayers and then say in Jesus' name and that guarantees it'll be done. It's almost like a stamp on a letter. That we just think we put the stamp on the letter and mail it, it'll get there. So I can be praying for all kind of stuff. Believing that I'm casting out devils and changing lives and cancers having to leave and all this mess is happening simply because I just said in Jesus' name. Anybody can say in Jesus' name. But not everybody's placing the man on his character. Anytime in Scripture that you see in the name of something, it does not mean in the name of Jason, in the name of Wilson, in the name of Brian, in the name of Belikia. It means in the character of. He says, when you place a demand on my character, whatever you ask. Because I know that when you place a demand on my character, what you ask will not be amiss in my spirit. And my thoughts will be your thoughts and my ways will be your ways. And then we use this scripture that we like to twist for our own justification. And he says, and I will give you the desires of your heart. But it's because my heart looks like Jesus. I'll access the desires of my heart when my heart looks like him. Whenever I can place a demand on his character, I'll do whatever you ask. I'll perform whatever. I'll manifest whatever. I'll show myself to whomever. But watch. I cannot.
not manifest myself unless you ask with my character because I will not allow my character be, to be profaned. So I will not produce works through people whose lifestyle does not match their words. Because the weight doesn't fall on who they are. It falls on him. We have a responsibility to be the attraction to our culture for the kingdom of God. But we keep giving them one thing out of our flesh than what we're speaking with our mouth. And I have a responsibility to guard my father. I have a responsibility to guard his word. I have a responsibility to live according to his character. I want some whatever people. God wants some whatever people. God wants some anything is possible to him who believes people. God wants to shift. Guys, you're looking at him. It's a miracle. And will transform cities. I'm not just talking about one. I'm talking about many. Not by anything that we are. Y'all, I, I can preach okay sometimes, and sometimes I flub it up. But it's all about his spirit. I'll forever pray like David, God, do not take your spirit from me. For that's the only thing that moves mountains. It's the only thing that calls the captive to be free. It's the only thing that breaks the yoke of bondage. We can sing. We can shine lights. We can market. We can advertise. We can preach the paint off the walls. But it will only be his spirit that transforms. It will only be his spirit that redeems. Let's open our book. Father, I thank you. For there have already been lives healed. There have already been bodies healed. Minds have been set free. People have received you. It's already been a glorious day in the kingdom. We're just getting started. All because of your spirit. God, I pray, Father, that in one life, two lives, three lives, God, Father, that your word took root. That it challenged, God, that it challenged those, Father, that are sitting in this room, God, that, that we're to be the attraction, God, to our culture for the kingdom. It's to be our life. God, our, our, our dollar bills sometimes can't match up, God. And our, our artistic designs sometimes can't match up, God. Father, but the truth is, is that they can't match our lifestyle. They can't match our spirit. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit works in the lives of men and women. It reveals, God, your truths to men and women, God. It awakens them, God, to who they are in you. I pray every man, woman, boy, and girl in this place, God, has a revelatory moment right now that they see themselves as you see them, God. Father, they see that they are the tools. They are the literally the living word of God, Father, to our culture, God. Father, we, keep, we, we remain frustrated by our culture, but we are the shift to it, God. We're the ones, God, that can walk into any neighborhood, into any community, into any divisive situation, and bring healing and peace and deliverance to it. God, not because it's by our skin color, not because it's by our language, but because it's by our spirit, God. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. 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 God, we worship you today for the work you are doing, God, in and out of the lives of these men and women. God, send us out, God. Send us out to guard your word and to shift environments. Come on, just take a moment in, in your space and just thank him. Just worship him for a second, Father, I thank you. Hallelujah. If anybody has never received Jesus as your king, right now is that great moment. Make that decision. Make that decision. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship him. Father, I thank you that you're working on minds right now. I thank you, Father, that you're checking hearts, God. 
Father, that you're challenging spirits, God. I thank you, Lord, that you're driving out, Father, the unwanted, God. You're driving out the unwelcome, God. And, Father, you are resurrecting, God, a generation, Father, of people, Lord, that won't operate, God, according to their own talents and their own abilities, God. But, Father, you'll use them by your spirit, Lord. You'll empower, God, cities and nations by your spirit, God. We'll see the healing of our culture by your spirit, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I thank you for this house, God, where you're bringing men and women, God, of all backgrounds and all colors, God. Father, all socioeconomic statuses, God, all education levels, God. I thank you for the diversity, God, that you're building here. God, for you're bringing people together, God. Father, that had differences, God, in their skin color. God, that have differences, God, in their neighborhoods. But, God, they're unified by the same color of blood, God. And they're unified, God, by the same power of your spirit, Lord. I give you honor. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, somebody worshiping with me this morning. Give him honor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have been listening to the Rejuvenate Church broadcast. If you shared in today's service with us, visit us at www.rejuvenatechurch.com and send us a message. We would love to hear from you. Rejuvenate Church invites you to be our guest if you're in the upstate of South Carolina. We are located in Anderson, South Carolina, inside the Anderson Mall across from Books A Million. Our service times are Sundays at 1045 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. For up-to-date information, visit our website or connect with us on social media. We are found on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Pastor Jason Wilson and Rejuvenate Church desire to bridge the gap that divides race, age, and economic status. We are transforming culture by engaging and shaping men and women through relationships and positive kingdom influences. Thank you for listening. We look forward to the opportunity to share with you again at Rejuvenate Church 